Hi, and good morning all uh, from Singapore, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sayyiduddin Faridi, and on behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, I would like to uh, welcome you all to the ISAS International Conference on South Asia 2023. Uh, Today, we move into the final day of the conference and the fifth roundtable, which is uh, titled The Surveillance State in South Asia. And on the panel today, we have with us uh, Dr. V. Chitra, uh, Assistant Professor of Sociology and Anthropology here at the National University of Singapore. We are also joined by Dr. Sandeep Martia, Postdoctoral Fellow at the Center for Advanced Research in Global Communication and the Center on Digital uh, cultural, uh, digital culture and society at the Anberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. And finally, we also have with us Dr. Karthik Nair, Assistant Professor uh, of Film and Media Arts at Temple University. Today's session is being chaired by Dr. Karthik Nachiapan, uh, a research fellow here at the Institute of South Asian Studies at NUS. Uh, before I hand over the session to Dr. Uh, Kartik, I'll just uh, briefly remind the audience that we, they can use the Q&A function here on Zoom to pose any questions that they may have during the course of the roundtable. Uh, over to you, Kartik. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Said. And I wanted to just also join Said and welcome you all to the fifth roundtable of the ISAS International Conference on South Asia. Uh, which is the Institute's annual flagship conference. If you're just joining us for this session, uh, the focus of this year's conference is everyday experiences of the state in South Asia. Uh, other speakers so far have touched on different themes uh, under this topic. So how do uh, citizens perceive the state in everyday encounters, um, aspects related to uh, the state and governance in South Asia, and, and third is the limits and boundaries of the state that appear to be growing and expanding every day. Um, and this roundtable focuses specifically on the third theme by looking at the surveillance state in South Asia. Uh, the speakers and papers in this session will cover a wide range of issues under this theme. Um, so the issues like the links between the environment and technology and how the state is now operating by looking at satellites and how they help governments shape coastal policy, um, how specific bureaucratic practices in the 1970s in India set the stage for the current digital surveillance state. Uh, and finally, uh, looking deeply at this digital surveillance state by, by uh, talking about digital public infrastructures, which the Indian state is now increasingly interested in to massively expand its own remit. And as Saeed mentioned, we are really lucky to have three great scholars with us to talk about these issues, um, Chitra, Karthik, and Sandeep. Uh, the plan is for each of them to speak for about 12 to 15 minutes, after which we will go into a moderated discussion um, with them and the audience. Um, so the plan is for Chitra to begin and then followed by Karthik and Sandeep. Um, Chitra, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna start by sharing my screen. Hang on. And hopefully you can see the PowerPoint. Awesome. Um, I'm going to just minimize it to the one view here. Um, all right. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thanks to everyone at ISAS for this uh, awesome invitation. Thanks to everybody on the panel. And uh, um, uh, also thank you all, everybody in the audience for coming, you know, today morning to hear, hear us talk. Uh, I really appreciate it. All right, so I'm going to start my talk, which is titled Infinite Zoom, Tap Satellite Technology and Coastal Governance in India. One thing to note before I begin my talk is that I work with comics. I draw comics in my work. So what you'll see on screen are a lot of those comics. Now, comics have a lot of text on them. I haven't deleted them, but do not get caught up trying to read the text on screen. Just follow my voice and uh, that will be, I think, a little bit easier than straining your eyes. All right, here we go. In the early hours of July 31, 2012, the inhabitants of Moragao, a fishing village in Mumbai, were wakened by the looming presence of MV Pavit, a 77-meter-long oil tanker, and the, there it is, reached. The Coast Guard cast the event as a breach of national security and promised more rigorous marine patrols. 
for the mumbai for mumbai's near shore fisher community the kolis this meant heightened surveillance of coastal waters increased control over boat licenses and there was the danger that pavit would move with the tri tide and crash into the village events like a beach tanker and governmental responses to it are windows into the fundamental disjuncture between near shore fishing which is what uh, a lot of fishers uh, the kind of fishing that a lot of fishers on the coast practice at small scale and contemporary coastal management the divergences are divergences are most apparent in the agency they confront the non humans of the shoreline for instance while the fisher community saw pavit as an agent that caused a chain of reactions set within a web of socio economic and ecological relationships the state government treated it as an agent that had breached a line crossing into india's territorial waters so what i want to begin with is that there are at, at stake there are two ways of seeing the post and the one i want to focus on today in my brief talk is the one that dwells on the instrument that the indian government uses to see the coast which is really the satellite technology and satellite technology has various forms um and i'll go to some of them so the understanding that the coast is a securitized uh, bounded entity is a direct concept consequence of india's coastal regulatory zone policy or crz which is not just know that there is a coastal policy it organizes the coast as a territorial unit where resources can be mobilized and the borders secured since the coastal policy is fundamentally about controlling space uh these drawings especially cartographic drawings which are derived from satellite images are vital for this policy to function and so if you think about it if you say that the coast needs governing one of the first things you'll ask is say okay well what is the coast where does it begin and end and that is a very like geographic question right you have to in space locate the coast and the way to do that is through satellite now through satellite technology so this visual control over the coast allows the government to implement growth based policies in a tightly managed space which simplify fluid and complex relationships that sustain vibrant communities and economies it also categorizes fish and coastal dwellers in interesting ways so in the process of seeing things are happening to the things that are seen so one of the most important projects of the visual projects was this was the making of it it's not a thing uh, from the state's official part right this is a recreation of my understanding of what the drawing would look like it's not i'm not allowed to reproduce the thing, right so the drawing this drawing project was attached to the revised coastal policy which was released in 2011 the 2011 crz it set boundaries distributed rights and rights designated resource and heritage value to coastal elements so which is to say that this policy decided what the coast is as a territorial socio political and material entity none of which could happen without the granular vision provided by advancement in space technologies though the 2011 policy followed the structure of its predecessor it added a number of new zones and sub zones because if satellite technology had advanced to be able to see with that accuracy the fundamental assumption that lay at the heart of the policy and its architecture was that the development of sophisticated satellite technology would make this an easy task which it wasn't and that i know from my field work the coastal policy evolved hand in glove with the development of satellite technology and gis we can see a comparison between the first policy and the the second iteration this 1991 crz which is the one that's here which had just basically four zones uh was a slim document of a few pages and it focused on activities prohibited in the coastal zone the more recent version of the policy rely heavily on satellite technologies and survey technologies and this is an overview a very brief overview of the 2018 crz and you can see a number of sub zones appear a number of different new categories appear and they have to produce a higher resolution in picture of the coast with each iteration the crz has expanded the list of permissible activities and provided special permissions for large scale infrastructure projects and tourism or tourism projects right or or what is categorized under public good so this it included higher and higher resolution maps of individual properties and provisions for distributing land rights to coastal communities thus the number of things to be mapped and the level of detail has increased with each iteration while it seems like a good thing to have say a protected turtle hatching zone uh, which can be looked at from above with this vertiginous view and then mapped out 
This reordering has a devastating effect on the coastal ecologies and its non-humans. And this is measured, it's measurable, and we already know this because it fixes boundaries and arbitrary borders on a highly dynamic environment. It also has an impact on coastal communities who too are recategorized. And by coastal communities, I just want to say that I do not just mean the people who are dwelling on the coast, but I also mean communities of fish or communities that are, you know, of particular kinds of ecological formation, basically more than human worlds. The visual technologies that accompany the policy are not illustrative of it. They are not representational tools that make a policy applicable. They are the very basis of the policy. So we have to understand it that way. For example, and this is this is these are drawings from when I was following these cartographers around as they mapped the coast. Uh, but for example, during the 31st meeting of the National Coastal Zone Management Authority, which was held in 2016, representatives from coastal states were asked to give an account of the progress they had made on making these plans. In a lengthy response, the representative from the state of Maharashtra, which is which is where the place where I did my fieldwork, Mumbai, is located said that they, the state had decided to divide the task of creating the plans by individual districts, and their objective was to produce a GIS-based coastal information system that would work as an information kiosk through which individuals could check whether their property was a part of the CRZ and the kinds of restrictions that would come into play if it did. The kiosk would also act as an interface through which the public could come to know the coastal zone. While no such interface exists, the I, this idea of a kiosk is kind of descriptive of the wide range of GIS-based systems and the gro growing use of digital technologies, especially digital visual technologies in governance in India. The way in which a GIS-based interface moves seamlessly between scales, particularly zooms into a landscape, it confers a sense of accuracy, immersion, and immediacy to a, to a map or like a visual of a map a sentiment that lends well to the idea of a digital bureaucracy that is transparent, self-evident, seamless, and accessible. And one of the really beautiful things that a digital map does is that it centers the viewer. So it's able to explain to the person who is viewing exactly where do they stand within this coastal reordering. So in recent times, the and this is not from my book, and this is from a talk that was uploaded online uh, by ISRO, uh, in recent times, the fisheries department has started a new program that transmits highly accurate locational data of schools of fish by tracking chlorophyll released by algae and other factors also like seawater clarity and temperature. But so by reading these things from space or for, by images captured on space with varying kinds of different kinds of spectrum, what they do is they're able to pinpoint the location of fish, which are transmitted by GPS to um intensive fishers, not small scale coastal dwelling fisher, coast dwelling fishers, intensive fishers who are operating trawlers and poor per sea nets, right? So these contemporary satellite technologies are deeply rooted in long histories of mapping and territorial control and resource extraction. Topographic and cadastral maps are prime examples of how these, and these maps are rooted in that history of topographic mapping, of how maps functioned as material objects that articulated empire and imperial subjectivities. And I'm thinking back towards colonial mapping projects. In India, as in other parts of the colonial empire, the vertiginous view of these cartographic images allowed British officers to empty the landscape of its rich ecological relationships and, in, and impose a governmental order that fueled the global colonial economy. And this is no really no different. It's a different kind of uh, framework of extraction, if you will. One of the biggest ways in which the, and this is an example of how, uh, say this is, this is an example of how coastal mapping has changed over time. So you can see over time, the focus has really shifted onto land. So thinking of it in terms of property, which you, know, you probably got an idea of, of from the, from the little bit I told you about the kiosk. So if you see older maps from the 1600s really focused on the water and that water-based, watery focus moves to a landward focus as uh, systems of revenue come into play. And those kinds of histories of drawing, histories of drawing are also actually like are also actually deeply connected to the, the physical history of the coast. So a map like this leads into a map like this. So one of the biggest ways in which uh, satellite technology, uh, uh, in which satellite technology affects the coast, is through the way in which it accelerates the growth-based outlooks of the Indian fisheries industry. 
It does this by turning the coast into bounded areas that can be disciplined to prevailing policy perspectives. This creates the sense that the coast is at once comprehensible and increasingly divisible to a greater and greater degree. This accuracy and immediacy is directly linked to new forms of extractive environmental regimes because it allows the eye to atomize the coast as a bundle of resources and as a site of calculable resource potential. So one of the things that has really character, and I've, I, I admit that I kind of have fudged this graph a little bit because this is decadal data and then it moves into yearly data. So the, the gaps, I could have done a better job, but uh, um, that, is, I, that is a correction for another time. But uh, so one of the things you can see is that this is a perpetually rising line. And the reason it is a perpetually rising line with the kinds of growth rate is that there is the way in which the Indian Fisheries Department calculates. It says, okay, we have this economic zone, the zone, this territory, this territorial unit that has X million square kilometers. And from X million square kilometers, we can get, uh, say, Y million metric tons. We are not getting that. So therefore, we can extract more and more. And the more uh, resources they add to the coast, that Y metric continues to increase. So... For instance, uh, around uh, 2014, the total production the, of fish uh, in India crossed 14 million met, uh, metric tons in, 20, uh, in 2020, not 2014. And um, in, it set, the Indian state set a target of 22 million tons that we would have to reach in 2024. It would mean a dramatic rise. And this kinds of the perpetually rising graphs are deeply connected to satellite technologies, right? So these vertiginous visions drive the vertiginous visions of uh, satellite technology, drive the fishery sector's goals to dizzying heights, an ever rising line supported by an infinitely zooming eye. The outcome is already visible in collapsing fish stocks, the poverty debt cycle that smaller scale fishers often find themselves. This, and I just wanna close with this, it is imperative to look at how the state sees the coast because it's not just a mirroring, the very act of seeing and how it is done has material and ecological consequences. And I can talk more about, you know, what happens to the fishers or what happens to the fish um, and so on and so forth in the questions and answers. Uh, I can provide as much um, more detail as I have available. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Itra. That, that was fantastic. And we'll pick some of those threads up later in the discussion. So next, uh, I am going to go to Karthik. Uh, thank you, Karthik. Um, and it's great to follow Chitra's uh, paper. And I, I, I can also kind of illustrate some links that I think are present. Um, let me just share my screen. Give me one second. Is this visible? And it should be full screen. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just want to thank uh, the organizers of the conference. Uh, it's a lot of work to put this together. I'm really sorry I haven't been able to attend, uh, just owing to time difference and other commitments. Um, this panel is really exciting, and I'm hope looking forward to the conversation after. Uh, my paper today is titled Paper Histories of Censorship's uh, Bureaucracy. Um, and I hope to provide some kind of prehistories of the contemporary digital surveillance state. Um, and I'm going to read just in the interest of time. So originating with the colonial administrations of the British Raj, film censorship remains the most prominent instance of cultural regulation by the Indian state. Whatever reasons the censors have had for censoring films, such as obscenity, subversion, and criminal incitement, scholars of Indian film censorship have revealed the reasons beneath those, those reasons, such as paternalism, elitism, the anxieties of an old colonial order, the aspirations of a new nation state, pressures from the mob, pressures from the market. This disciplinary drive increasingly impinges on the freedom of expression enshrined in the nation's constitution as autocratic intercession of democratic expression in India is extended by pressure groups whipping up moral panics over cinema. Anxiety about the filmic image has manifested in the Indian state's continuous effort in Tejasvini Ganti's words, to discipline and regulate films, filmmaking, and filmmakers. In my forthcoming book, the cover of which you can see, Seeing Things, Spectral Materialities of Bombay Horror, I attract the materiality of that effort to censor 
by enhancing the picture of ideological and affective control by focusing on film strip editing and bureaucratic paperwork. With a focus on horror films made between the late 70s and early 90s in Bombay, I argue that close attention to the physical practices of censorship or how censors censor textures our understanding of what was censored and why. Now, my book examines the censorship of horror films in the late 1970s moment in the period following what is known as the emergency. And just a quick picture of what, what I mean by the emergency. In the summer of 1975, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi had a state of internal emergency declared to quell opposition from trade, student, and government unions, and to remain in power after a court conviction over electoral misconduct. Over the next 21 months, blackouts descended on printing presses, journalists were detained en masse, public assembly was curtailed, civil disobedience movements were banned, and dissenting news stories were killed. When film producers complained of increased oversight of the film capital, that is Bombay, by the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting in the nation's political capital, that is Delhi, the Minister of Information and Broadcasting was said to be, quote, furious, ordering the censor board not to pass films, to make more and more cuts, and generally to harass producers, unquote. Now, when the emergency ended in 1977, the state invested in increasing bureaucratization as the path to procedural transparency. While filmmakers and viewers became keenly aware of censorship's power to make images and films disappear. This is the transitional moment in which horror films emerge in the Bombay film industry. And reconstructing the material terrain of censorship of this period allows us to see how the politics of transition are registered in paper files and celluloid damage. Uh, this is a table of contents for the book, which will be out in uh, early January of 2024. Um, and for the purposes of the talk today, I'm drawing from chapter one, which is titled Paper Cuts Inside the Bureaucratic Encounter with Darwaza. But if you have a look at the table of contents, you can see that the first two chapters focus on paper cutting and celluloid editing as forms of censorship. Chapters three and four focus on production aesthetics and production practices in Bombay horror films. And chapter five um, focuses on the circulation of these films in theaters and on videotape. And I'm happy to go into more detail about other chapters and how they relate uh, to the argument today in question and answers. Uh, just to say, for example, I was very um, intrigued by Chita's argument because in chapter three, um, one of the arguments I make for the changing kind of geography of Bombay horror is how um, the increasing political mobilization of Bombay cinemas below the line workforce within the film industry in the city drove filmmakers outside the city and away from the surveillance of increasingly kind of militant unions producing a kind of gothic geography of Bombay horror, but that's a different topic. Um, but as you can see, chapter one focuses on the bureaucratic management of Darwaza or Door, a 1978 film by the Ramsey brothers, advertised as India's first horror film. And you can see a newspaper advertisement for the film to the right of your screen. This is from the Times of India. Um, with a very tantalizing uh, invitation to open the door to new excitement in motion pictures. Now, as with all uh, commercial films, the first formal audience of Bomb Bombay Horror, including of Darwaza, was the state, right? Um, and between the initial application for Darwaza to be certified for public release, and when it was finally cleared for release, months passed in rejection, deferral, revision, and reversal by the government. Throughout, the relationship was mediated by papers that moved between the censor board and the film's creators, the Ramsey brothers, which included letters of application and official notifications, scribbled notes, and censor scripts. Darwaza, as you can tell from that advertisement, aimed to induce a new excitement in motion pictures. And censorship documents from this period can help us understand how this new excitement was felt by the film's first audience, the state. Now, Lawrence Liang, writing about censorship, says, we must imagine the moment, quote, where the officers of the law are huddled together in a small dark room, notepad and pen in hand, watching a rather bizarre montage of images. Such acts of censorship, Liang continues, expose an underlying secret, quote, 
legal reason has to come down from its elevated position and modes of discourse to enter a murky space, unquote. As the narrative of Darvaza verges down towards a cobwebbed cave strewn with corpses, the paper trail of government reports, official digests, and release certificates helps illuminate the journey that the censors took as they watched the film. Now, if, as filmmakers often felt in this period, that the operations of censors are, quote, kept secret, and a filmmaker is treated like a culprit, and his creation is judged in secret by a group of five or ten persons, unquote, the documents of censorship enable us to enter that secret room to witness the making of those judgments as they were being made. And that is kind of the broader framing argument of the chapter. The chapter begins by looking more closely at uh, the censor certificate for the film. Now, the censor certificate is a familiar site to many people here. Um, it signals the government's authority over images. No film can be shown without being cleared by the state-run censor board. And censor certificates are required to appear before every film in a theater or on television as proof and product of a successful certification process. The certificate's flickering appearance on every screen thus accomplishes the state's penetration into the private and public spaces of everyday life in India. But the state's power also extends over the time of cinema. For example, print laboratories in my period were instructed not to print positives of a film that did not yet have a census certificate. No film could be preserved at the National Film Archive without a census certificate. In fact, the continuing mandatory placement of the certificate before the film is also a forced interpolation of a delay, a reminder of the state's power to keep films as well as their makers and viewers waiting. As an inscription of force, the power to keep films waiting uh, indicates how the nominally invisible bureaucracy of censorship is made present and sensible to us. By rule, the photographed certificate, which is affixed to the print of a film, such as this one, had to be displayed for a minimum duration of 10 seconds, stipulated at least five meters of footage for a film at the Raza's length. And the collective act of gazing at the certificate would thus constitute an imagined national public at the movies in a kind of synchrony. Now, familiar though they are as symbols of power on our screens, certificates are somewhat forgotten for their materiality. Census certificates begin as rectangular sheets of white paper that are printed in bulk and transported to the offices of the censor board. Here they are inked in by hand, signed, creased and folded, smudged and scribbled on, photographed so that they can be placed at the head of film prints, saved and stored for future use. Before and after they surface as images, censor certificates are things that emerge from an underworld of forms, files and court orders which invisibly control the public life of cinema in India. To synchronize diverse moviegoers into a homogenous Indian public, censorship has historically coordinated its decision-making across a geographically dispersed hierarchy. Like many other large operations that originated in the colonial administration, it is designed to enable administration at a distance." Unquote. Now, if censorship's standardized codes, rules, top-down operations are fantasies of centralized control, then the Gazette of India is the paper technology by which that control was sought to be executed. The Cinematograph Act specified that all decisions of the censors were to be published in the Gazette of India. By consulting the Gazette, theatrical exhibitors and police officers far removed from film producers and state regulators could check for itemized deletions or what were called particulars, verifying the legal status of what was being screened. This issue of the Gazette of India that's on the screen right now carried information about the censorship of Darwaza and its trailer. So if you look to the right of your screen, you will see um, the listing of particular itemized deletions. So at the bottom of the first image, you'll see a directive to have deleted close-ups of front and back view of the monsters. Uh, delete views of a frightening skeleton, so on and so forth. What's really fascinating for my own purposes is that this issue of the Gazette was issued and printed in September 1978, nearly six months after Darwaza first opened in theaters. In fact, I found out films certified in January 1978 were listed in September 1978 issues of the Gazette 
film certified in September 1978 were listed in June 1979 issues of the Gazette. Film certified in late 1979 did not appear at all in 1980 issues of the Gazette, nor in 1981, nor even in the first months of the following year. By the summer of 1982, exhibitors put out a plea to the central government to, quote, keep the public and in particular exhibitors informed about the film certified by the censor board to, by publishing the relevant information in a timely manner in the Gazette of India. These exhibitors complained that they were particularly worried about this lapse on the part of the government because under the law, an exhibitor is held responsible for the unauthorized exhibition of uncensored films and can be punished with imprisonment up to two years. As anxiously felt duration, the delay in printing could well serve as another inscription of state power over popular cinema. But the Gazette's delay may very well have indexed the material reality of how decentralized censorship was, an unavoidable result of all the typing, collating, retyping, mailing, collating, retyping, printing, and mailing scattered across a geographically sprawling operational chain in which while it was headquartered in Bombay, Serving the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting in Delhi, censorship actually operated across seven different outposts, um, each of which processed hundreds of films every year. As Akhil Gupta has put it, bureaucracies are machines for the production of inscriptions, but printing presses are machines for the production of printed paper. Because it unfolds over physical space and in durational time, the very paper chains of the Gazette of India that were devised to realize synchronic surveillance of film censorship had also introduced a materiality not fully synchronized with the fantasies of centralized cens censorship. Now the legacy of the materiality of paperwork and its possible delays haunts the censor certificate in its digital and contemporary incarnation. In 2019, the Censor Board announced a new design of the Censor Certificate, which looks in many ways similar to the older iterations, with a crucial difference. This one has a QR code that you can scan, and I actually welcome you to scan the code as it appears right now. If you were to scan this code with your smartphone's camera and provided it is connected to the internet via a cellular data service or Wi-Fi, a browser window will open, redirecting you to the sensor board's page, listing what deletions were made from this film. In this way, surveillance is extended via the affordances of private network operators and smartphone manufacturers to forge a new market citizen spectator of censorship via a fantasy of immediation. And I'll stop there and I'm happy to discuss this further in question and answers. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Karthik. Uh, and finally, I'm going to go to Sandeep. Hi. Uh, am I audible? And the screen share is working all right? Great. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the organizers for the invitation. And thank you to Karthik for chairing the session. Uh, and to my co-presenters, Chitra and Karthik, for these wonderful papers. Um, I'm going to jump into uh, what we can vaguely uh, identify as our contemporary condition of surveillance or uh, related to surveillance, because uh, as with most things in the contemporary Indian state, it is hard to specify uh, what exactly is going on beyond the, uh, the most visceral performances of state's coercive power, uh, th there is very little that uh, we can gauge about what the massive uh, world's largest uh, digital infrastructures are really up to. And uh, what I will try to do in my short time today is just give some broad strokes, highlights of where we are uh, in terms of development of data-driven governance and digital infrastructures, specifically digital public infrastructures, and raise some key questions on how to study them. Okay, this is uh, a small section from my dissertation, which I completed at NYU two months ago, and I'm still recovering from it. So I would welcome any comments and questions you have that help me specify this further. Okay. Um, So 
So uh, since Chitra and uh, Karthik have already pointed out long histories of state involvement uh, in this sphere, uh, I would just briefly uh, mention that surveillance and the state's role in it is as old as the concept of state. Uh, the very uh, official statistics, uh, the history of official statistics is as old as that of state formation uh, and how they are mobilized for different kinds of uh, knowledge production for making citizens knowable uh, and governable. Uh, in the Indian context, uh, what, what is of immediate importance is the post-liberalization state saw a shift in terms of who gets to collect data and who gets to store data and who gets to uh, process data. A lot of these terms are also fairly uh, uh, put uh, are are put as backward compatibility into the histories of data, which otherwise were not seen as histories of data processing or data analytics, can now be seen uh, like that. But what is really the game changer, as it were, is the uh, biometric infrastructure called Aadhaar, which I'm sure everybody in this in this audience would be familiar with, which uh, happened to have unfolded alongside the big data revolution. And the coterminous developments that we have seen in the last decade in the sphere of governance and in the sphere of what you may broadly call as digital capitalism or big tech uh, or the, the smartphone culture and so on, uh, have created a lot of confusion about what exactly are the relationships between these two, how regional or global they are in their spatial uh, extent, and uh, how is value being produced in all of this. So these are the couple of questions that I'm leading with, and I'm specifically trying to avoid the, the most popular uh, easy answers of what is global surveillance capitalism or what is data colonialism, because these uh, both of uh, both those examples have elements of truth, but as we will see, they they barely scratch the surface on what is going on in most of the world. And before I delve into uh, that analysis, let me show you a, a one minute clip of pure propaganda. Using technology to leapfrog. India is emerging as a digital powerhouse. India's strong digital public infrastructure. Today, every citizen has a bank account. With the integration of a billion plus Jandhan bank accounts, a billion plus biometric Aadhaar cards, a billion plus mobile phones, we have laid strong foundations for India's digital public infrastructure. Over 460 million bank accounts have been opened in the last seven years, where women are the biggest beneficiaries, approximately 230 million. Aadhaar card, unique digital identity, has revolutionized the last mile delivery of services. A billion plus mobile phones, including 750 million smartphones, have driven financial inclusivity and security across the country. Yeah, so a billion plus this, a billion plus that, uh, those numbers are highly significant because value production in this sphere uh, operates on the logics of venture capitalism, which is a very unique kind of uh, financial capitalism, very different from other models of uh, neoliberalism or uh, state capture that we have previously known. And there are there are specific material uh, infrastructures behind this larger than life narrative. And we need to pay close attention to those infrastructures. And one of the key highlights uh, here is the hourglass infrastructure of Aadhaar. Uh, if anyone wants to get into it in the Q&A, we can talk more about it. But the whole thing was designed in a way from the beginning so that it can act as a platform on which you can build several other things. And how do you do that? By large scale centralization uh, and potential monetization of data, not uh, an always already monetized uh, form at all. This is a rough timeline. Uh, a project that was supposed to be uh, a national security project only for border states 
uh, is now embroiled with our payments, our banking, our phones, our uh, any kind of transaction that you can imagine you conduct with the state or private entities, and much more so if you're a recipient of any of the welfare services of the state. And, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. And to, to highlight something that scholars of globalization in the state have long pointed out that this is a transnational state and these technologies are as global as anything can be. So these are not just a quote unquote Indian uh, 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 phenomena, even though these digital public infrastructures are Indian, we, we are innovating uh, a lot in that sphere, but at the same time, we are exporting these technologies uh, to, to many parts of the world, including developed countries, which uh, took our COVID platform in during 2020, 2021. All right. So what I want to highlight here is this force of acceleration and the speed of future making, which is critical to understand if we have to uh, understand the present moment and how it is different from previous iterations of states surveillance practices or digital governance. The, the rate of growth of India's digital economy is the uh, fastest in the world and has been so for a long while. The rate of growth of India's tech startups is also among the fastest in the world, was second uh, fastest during the two years of the pandemic. Uh, and we have the third highest number of tech startups in the world now. Interestingly, the Indian government is the second largest incubator of tech startups in the world after China. The state plays a very direct, active and performative role. Uh, I'm not getting into details of the Startup India uh, program uh, right now, but if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to do that. But as you might expect with all things in India and South Asia, contradictions galore. And this is the, uh, this is a good snapshot of global digital demographics right now, or pretty much right now, where the largest number of non-users are in South Asia. And this is also for tech companies, uh, the, the largest uh, potential market, the next billion users are here. The infrastructure at the heart of it, uh, as many of you might be aware, and there has been a lot of great scholarship and public writing on Aadhaar's endless failures and how it costs people their, their jobs, their ration, their uh, welfare uh, services, uh, entitlements, and so on. And the, the more shinier aspects of India's digital public infrastructures of uh, how convenient they are, how scalable they are, how decentralized they are, uh, do not produce any value. We are the only state uh, only large state uh, currently that is financing fi fintech companies, subsidizing fintech companies for God knows what end, the only speculation one can put forth is data collection and potential monetization in the future, not now. The temporality is key. Uh, here is a tweet by one of India's rather successful entrepreneurs about what is the macroeconomic reality uh, behind this growth of the digital economy on one hand and uh, the state's involvement in it. He's speaking more on the economic front. Okay, so I'll quickly shift gears and try to explain why I'm trying to capture these two things together. Uh, one can very well say that this, this startup st stuff is separate from what the state is trying to do, but the two in the last decade or post 2016 or so, are very intimately related with each other, interface with each other. And as recent as the uh, India's Data Protection Act makes a special exemption for startups as data fiduciaries, which no other uh, uh, comparable global uh, data protection legal framework does. So there's a, there's a specific relationship between the state and startups and the bridge between is data. The shared object of imagination is data. So what is at stake in understanding India's emergent digital public infrastructures is the relationship between the materiality and speculative power of data. It is impossible to determine whether it is 
more on the the uh, material uh, aspects of data about what you can exactly do with biometric data as it is multiplied with your credit card, as it is multiplied with your demographics, as it is multiplied with your spending habits and so on. Uh, nor can we, uh, because no profits are being produced, it is hard for even the people who have their skin in the game, quote unquote, to project when exactly a lot of these loss making startups will actually make any profit in India. So neither the straightforward uh, logics of neoliberalism or that of governmentality, just collecting all this data for pure uh, exercise of power, simply explain what's going on. And here I, I shift to uh, the concept of dream work, which uh, the anthropologist uh, of Nance Arjuna Padurai uh, coined in 2015 as the idea that brings together the space of fantasy, speculation, and unbridled imagination, and the space of productivity, discipline, and instrumentality. The emergent digital public infrastructures, uh, I argue, are instrumentalizing data that was initially collected for governance and welfare purposes. Aadhaar collection in 2009 10 didn't happen in the name of startups, uh, but is now used to drive speculative value production. There are many continuities in the content of the dreams of digital India and startup India and of earlier paradigms of modernization and neoliberal development because of the hard realities of mass poverty and electoral populism keep the welfare state from completely unbundling itself. The medium and the infrastructure of the content of development, however, are now wildly different from those of the state-owned uh, or produced radio, television, and cinema. Contemporary digital infrastructures are enabling the state to assemble people to undertake the everyday work of imagining, narrativizing, and producing certain and pursuing, sorry, certain dreams of data-driven governance and entrepreneurial value production. I argue that the dream work of digital public infrastructures in India, narrativized by slogans of digital and financial inclusion, is to magnify and exploit the shared use and value of data as an object of computing, entrepreneurship, and governance for creating a promissory, centralized, and state-friendly architecture of aspirational life. That is key. Uh, and this is visible in any sphere of contemporary public life in India, not just the uh, that of startups. Uh, this architecture is far more agile than the post-colonial state's five-year national plans. And while it is neoliberal in appearance, appearance, it is materially and discursively leading to only greater state control on the possibilities of future making. To be sure, post-Adar architecture is quite leaky and is not necessarily bureaucratically efficient. Thank God for our mediocrity. However, it is certainly more agile in terms of rendering and projecting the state as a stack of layers of data that can be plugged into the startup ecosystem to produce both go good governance and entrepreneurial value. And here, the concept of stack is absolutely central to how these systems are technologically designed and how they are narrativized and imagined. Uh, if I have a couple of more minutes, uh, how am I doing on time, Karthik? Uh, you have about two minutes. OK, great. Uh, I want to touch upon one, uh, the other key takeaway from this. We saw the global spatialization of these elements. There is a very, very strong regional heterogeneity in how these systems are designed and implemented. There is, of course, the entity called India Stack, and many st regional states have taken on the mantle of creating their own regional stacks. And I did two years of fieldwork in Rajasthan at their iStart uh, startup program. And they have created this wonderful entity called India's largest startup incubator, and which is, uh, I'm going to rush through all this, but this is the key thing, Ratstack, an innovative platform providing digital infrastructure to startups, developers, and businesses. And what is Ratstack? It has eSign, it has payment platforms, it has centralized data hub, SMS services, cloud services, and so on. It is basically a regional iteration or what is imagined uh, to be India stack uh, by Nandan Ilikini and others involved with iSpirit and so on. Uh, the beauty of RAT stack, the API's application programming interfaces that it promises and that it uh, has been doing so since 2017, I want to say, is that it only exists on paper. Uh, it only exists as a test module within the state's large 
uh, uh, governance architecture, digital governance architecture, yet it is narrativized, it is mentioned in every publicity presentation, video, uh, news article, and so on. And there are a couple of startups that have gotten access to some data sets through specific requests. But the fact that a thing is there since 2017, and even though people aren't computationally using it, even aren't materially using it, but it is rendering the state into something that can be imagined as a stack. That's something that can be associated with value production. That is extremely crucial to understand and here, contemporary digital media theory meets good old anthropology of the state because what we are witnessing is exceptional, is unique in terms of its temporality. Uh, the, the modern West uh, never had to, the, tr their transition to digital economy happened very differently from ours and I'm happy to speak more about it in the Q&A if anyone has any questions. Uh, I'll leave you with a couple of more philosophical takeaways from uh, Nandan Nilikani himself. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sandeep. Uh, could you just close the PowerPoint so we can, yeah. So. Fantastic, thank you. So th those were really three great rich papers. Uh, that are that have a lot connecting them as well. Um, I know that our audience, that our audience, will have questions, and so there are some already there. Um, so maybe I'll just start off because I have my own thoughts and ideas, and on all three presentations, and maybe I'll have I have I have maybe one question each for each for each paper and presenter. Maybe I'll start with Chitra. Um, I. I I don't. I was wondering as I was kind of listening to you whether there are actually private actors involved in mapping the coastline. Um, I don't know. Maybe Google Maps, Apple Maps. Maybe there are other actors that have much better technologies than the government and the state in trying to figuring out the coast, the boundaries, uh, and what role do they play here? Does the state work with them? Does is is it interested in working with them? And what are the kinds of power dynamics that exist between the state and different kinds of private actors engaged in these pro in these GIS processes? Um, so that's one. Uh, and and the, the 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 second maybe smaller one I'll just put it in there. You actually you mentioned how does at some point you mentioned how does the state see the coast, right? And I kept thinking who in the state uh, are there different kind of understandings about where various entities, agencies in the in the state, and how they see the coast, and their and whether those logics um, align, whether they differ, uh, and how do those trade offs, contradictions resolve themselves? Um, so, so the, those are my thoughts for you, uh, Karthik. That was great. I, I don't work on film and media studies. I know very little about horror movies. I don't really watch horror movies. Um, but I'm I'm just interested on you know in, on on a couple of things on the process of certification. Um, I was thinking, what are some of the reasons that the state would use to refuse to certify a film, and whether that has changed over time over the seventies, eighties, nineties, um, and and second, uh, I'm just curious because um, you were talking about the different kind of. Um, uh, tactics used by some of these um, state actors. When does the categorization come in? At what point? Uh, and when when they whether it's a U U A film or an A film or an S film, um, was that early on, or did that kind of um, that was that and was that a way through which these um, op operatives within the state could wield power at some point? Um, because I know that's also a very contested process, um, and and maybe may, may, maybe just quickly, lastly, uh, just in terms of kind of, did you get a chance to speak to some of these folks um, in the censorship office? Because uh, you mentioned that at some, you know, that's it's it's administration at a distance. Do they communicate with each other? My guess is there are a lot of different regional offices here, right, uh, under the CBFC or under. The, the body that certifies films and do they communicate do they talk to each other how uh, 
I mean, how coordinated is it? Are they effective? I mean, I'm just trying to just get a sense of the process here as well. Um, uh, uh, Sandeep, that, that, that was fantastic. Um, so just a kind of couple of thoughts. Um, you know, every time I kind of, did, um, I mean, on the, so I've not, I've not heard the dream work uh, conception used to make sense of what's happening in, in terms of data and DPIs. Um, that sounds great. That sounds very effective and new. I, I'm wondering how how will you incorporate the security logics there in terms of what the state wants to do? Because I mean, every time I go there, there's a clear political economy aspect uh, which you which you detailed in your in your presentation. But but also, I think the the state wants to control data also because it wants control, right? There are a lot of security uh, exigencies. There are a lot of pressures. It's very difficult for the Indian state to obtain data from foreign actors. They don't. They haven't really negotiated, you know, multilateral agreements with other countries. So, and that's another reason that's driving what the government wants to do. Even though they don't come out and say it as uh, as openly as 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 they can, but I I think it's it's there. And 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 so how does that? How does that, I think, fill in or factor into your to this dream work conception and how you're thinking about data and DPIs in India? So I will stop here and, and then maybe after that we can go into the QA with the audience. Um, who wants to go first? Uh, Chitra, to start with you and then work away the same order. Yeah. Uh, also, really good questions. Um, and um, uh, so, in brief, like who are the other actors, and uh, who, and you know, who are the actors within this? Like, who, what is the, really the state when it comes to seeing? Like, who is doing the scene? Excellent, excellent question. This has to do with the history of geospatial policy in India, and it has to do with the history of the CRZ itself, as well as satellite technology. So there are two, three things happening. In 2011, you know, all of the uh, base maps actually came from existing topographic surveys, and Around 70s, we had like a satellite program and that was not, uh, you know, ISRO sent up a bunch of stuff and that was not very highly granular. You were getting like, uh, I forget the resolution you were getting, but it was all these hand-drawn uh, maps that were based off of uh, existing topographic sheets. By 2011, CRZ gets decentralized because of there's a big pushback against the 1991 policy, which is that, oh, this can't be like this, you know, one, uh, the central oversight coastal states need to have some control, which is when all the state authorities are set up and they report to a national authority. Okay, So CRZ by itself is, as an entity gets created. The state authority, then the state, each state decides how this is going to happen. In Maharashtra, the government decided each district will appoint whoever they know there are the, the Indian government puts out a list of seven organizations that are allowed to map the state because uh, you have to remember the map policy at that time uh, listed the coast as a very, very sensitive zone. So not everybody can map the coast, even though by 2004, you have Google Maps available online. So this exists, but this restriction also exists, right? And so, uh, and the interesting thing is, and so then the they appointed, uh, the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai appointed Anna University, who came, who mapped, and they have done a lot for, uh, uh, and they created these maps. And this, these maps are also, highly controlled documents, but you will find PDFs online. So this is the kind of absurdity of it in some sense. And the high resolution satellite images used to create the vector, the vector plans, the digital plans came from Google. So it, there is a really interesting kind of mashup happening by, in the official process. Yes, there are, there are other actors too. The play between the official and the unofficial is murky. You know, and we know this. We know this from a lot of literature on what is official, what is informality in India. So, uh, in fact, it's written in the policy itself that traditional communities are allowed to map their uh, spaces and make claims for development. So basically, it says that you can self-develop. That's what it says. But self-develop means what? Then they hired private, con some of them hired private contractors to come up with these fantasy plans of what this coastal land, which is now high, re high you know, high value real estate in Mumbai can become. So then you have these other maps floating as well. The interesting thing is the 
it's it's about not necessarily whether there are maps or not but what a court might recognize as a as an official map so you have a number of court cases right where uh, somebody comes and says oh this the government is illegally building a hospital there were mangroves here in this time and the, so therefore it's an ecologically sensitive zone you can't have it and the judge says well you've given me the satellite map but what if there's a cloud obscuring it what if i don't know and you know so it then goes back to the topographic sheet so there is a way in which officialness is produced also in the judicial discourse right in terms of like how can a document get of official um status and interestingly enough so the fisher community leverage this so they'll say if they reach out to architecture schools because they don't want to play pay private developers to create a conceptual plan the architecture schools want to educate their uh, students about participatory governance so they come and create a map and then the fisher communities um come and say well try to make it in the same colors and scale and everything as the official plan so that when a municipal corporator comes we can show them so it looks like it it's mimetic right it's like there's mimesis so there is this kind of very interesting play between official and unofficial that happens so i have a whole chapter on it um and i'll very happily share that with you um and yeah so it's 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 a really fun question and now it's become very very interesting because the geospatial policy has once again changed and said everybody can have access to this so kind of opened the dam so now we we are in this other terrain but at the same time uh they've made um access they, they kind of have controlled access because maps you need to pay a lot of money so then this again raises a question of who has access to the maps who is able to make environmental claims and of course this really largely affects low income communities or ngos or activists because if they don't have access to the official maps it's hard to make a claim case in in a court that's really where it you know the rubber meets the road sorry long answer but fabulous question thank you thanks sir um i yeah. can go next please karthik yeah uh thanks for the questions um i think it might be useful because i also saw the, the question that came up from the audience it might be useful to kind of get a broader lay of the land of film censorship film censorship in post colonial india very much carries over from film censorship in colonial india that's the first thing that's important to know um of course what what changes and what people note is that the uh, kind of the constitutional guarantees the freedom of expression seems to be impinged upon now by the state's ability to intercede images right um however the supreme court has in multiple cases over the decades declared that cinema is an unusual case because of its ability through film and sound images and sound to induce affects and generate mimetic states uh, in viewers and therefore is in need of a specific kind of regulation um and that's also connected to the kind of class gendered and other assumptions about the mass audiences of indian cinema what's useful to note and to know because this this is kartik's question um there's a code that guides censorship decisions so uh, between there's a code of 1960 and then very usefully for me in 1978 there was a new code that was published just at the start of 1979 and in the book i try to make the argument um it's an exploratory argument about whether the encounter with india's first horror film had an effect in in that is visible in the revisions to the code because one of the phrases that's added to the new code is scenes of horror must be avoided right and i am i try to ask the question what could scenes of horror mean by looking closely at what was removed from the darwaza right and so that is kind of the argument i'm making in the book now the code uh, lists many objects of proscription they are generally seen as things that might incite criminality upset public order all of that um offend the average citizen is a phrase that's often used we we're also not familiar with the generic language that's used um and we can't take it too seriously uh what's interesting for me is that um the censorship of bombay horror films to kind of particular kind of salience because of assumptions about who is watching these films and so the question you're asking about the u versus a or the universal versus adult which are the two categories available to censors in this moment are not just to be understood as empirically mapping on to people under 18 or people above 18 
but to be understood as mapping on to who was assumed to be the dominant audience of a film. Is it an urban educated audience or is it a non-urban or working class or often rural non-educated audience? And so the category of adult and child was mapped not in terms of chronology of age, but in terms of this kind of spatialization of time, right? So in terms of kind of this geography that redistributed age in a weird way. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, Jan Dushman, which is a film I write about, which came out in 1979, was censored by the government uh, because in the words of the Minister of Information and Broadcasting, it contained pointless scenes of violence which would offend the ordinary citizen. In the book, I reconstruct the kind of cultural moment in which this film was censored and connected to anxieties that were provoked by the famous Mathura rape case of the 70s. And so questions then about violence against women and how film was attributed to a certain kind of mimetic capacity. Um, I'm not the first person to be making such arguments. William Mazzarella has written about film censorship as a form of affective regulation. Lalita Gopalan has an excellent book on censorship. Those are some of the sources with which I'm working. But I, the, the difference is that I'm working quite closely with paper documents, which brings me to your other question, Karthik, which is that did they all talk to each other? Yes, they probably did in many ways that do not leave traces on paper, right? And so um, the, the kind of limits of my archive is what is left behind on paper. I have talked to a few censors, but they either feign uh, not remembering or do not remember um, kind of encountering horror films in their experiences with censorship. What becomes very important to me then in my argument is what it is about these films that is exciting enough or offensive enough to generate a trace, right? And so if there's a, a document that's 100 pages long, what are the moments in a film that are um, powerful enough to generate, let's say, red ink and a kind of strike through on paper, right? And so then I use those kinds of traces to create the sensorium of the encounter with horror. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Sandeep? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's great uh, questions and uh, the great conversation. Uh, we learned so much from the responses from Chitra and Karthik. Um, security logics, uh, no, no easy answers there, but uh, there is a lot of dream work and fantasy of digital sovereignty, of data sovereignty, because uh, these digital networks have been splintering states' territorial control since early 2000s, and all states are grappling with it uh, in, in different ways. Uh, so there are, there are no easy fix answers there, but there is a lot of performance uh, of uh, what it would mean to uh, achieve uh, data sovereignty, create smoke screens of data colonialism, and big tech players riding behind the wave of geo investing in geo instead of directly uh, uh, participating in the market because they know the, the politics of decision making of uh, is, is so fraught in contemporary India that where their bets are safe and not. So uh, it's, it's a very messy uh, scenario. Um, and we, we are seeing a large, large, large investment in data centers with uh, a very infamous billionaire being involved in uh, making data centers all over India. It's a familiar story of dispossessing farmers, uh, uh, tribals from their land to create data centers uh, in large parts of Gujarat, Central India, and so on. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's it's a complicated scenario. But what the state is trying to do in the name of security logics is not just for security. Uh, that much is at least clear. I'll stop there. Uh, I'm in like post midnight haze now, but uh, I can see a couple of questions in the Q and A. Uh, should I answer them? Yeah, maybe let's so let, let's go there now, and I'll start in the order that was given and start with Chitra. Uh, have you observed how small and medium scale fishermen navigate this particular situation? Do they aspire for more technology driven solutions? Um, to increase their competitiveness? Or do they think these technology-driven solutions will make them more competitive? 
Uh, thank you for that uh, question. Um, uh, so it's really interesting in terms of small scale fishers. This it, it it's really important to kind of know the categories that the state uses to see you know kind of to think about fishers. A lot of the fall, small scale fishers fall into the category of traditional, which the problem with that is that the way in which the traditional occupations are uh, understood by the state is is that they're inefficient. So a lot of the support that's happening right now is happening for uh, intensive fishing. So trawler licenses or per scene netting, those are all technologies through which a huge amount of fish are captured. Uh, smaller scale fishing also tends to be non-itinerant. So it's not necessarily people going and finding fish. They are very uh, old, like there are long histories of marine tenure that divide the coast. And those are interesting too, because that happens on water, which the state does not map. I also don't want to give the impression that this is like a, a cartography versus counter cartography situation. Small scale fishing is highly already technological. People use GPS systems and things like that. So uh, net technologies have changed the materials that net, you, net, net is made of, the gauge in which the net is. So those things are highly technological questions. So I do not want to give the impression that this is a question of technology versus non-technology, not at all. In fact, I think you, the way I'd imagine it is that there is a political spectrum in which even images exist, like a techno-visual spectrum. Um, and so it's, uh, um, in some sense, like the small-scale fishes also do want to be seen by the state, because if you are seen and mapped by the state, then you are allowed to, you know, uh, gain value from your land especially because small scale fishing is slowly like slowly declining in india so most people want to actually develop land and give it to their kids it's a keep it as property or uh, develop it and you know earn money from rent so these things are uh, um not necessarily dichotomous but yeah there is a whole question of seeing technology and how to be seen that comes into play here i hope that helps Great. Um, so next is for Karthik, which I think you began answering in in the in your response. But is there anything you'd like to add here on the question of freedom of expression, and how does the state balance that with other priorities? Yeah. Um. I I was looking at the question. Um. I I don't think I'm taking a position on whether film censorship is desirable or undesirable. Um, the interest is kind of tracking historically um, <clears throat> uh, what's happening in this moment now. As I said earlier, um, it seems in instinctively that there's a kind of contradiction between the freedom of expression and censorship, right? But uh, as I I kind of track in the book, um, multiple Supreme Court judgments have noted what they feel is a kind of affective power of film that needs to be regulated. Um, and then the kind of the, the broad strokes kind of history that I map is one of state control of um, commercial film production, right? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, what's very interesting uh, for me that is kind of, kind of connect to Karthik's earlier question is why films that were certified as for adults only still needed to be purged of images, right? And the kind of the the, the the only kind of reasonable conclusion one can arrive at is this um, understanding of uh, Indian audiences as um, um, kind of infantilized by the state, right? And so in, in, in need of protection or custodianship. However, um, I think the picture would be incomplete today if we just focused on state control of private enterprise, because of course, we now live in an age in which private enterprises are also in the position to censor, right? And to kind of control mm -hmm. what it is that is not only expressed, but uh, how those expressions are shown up. So for example, through algorithmic throttling or manipulation, what we see, don't see. And the way I ended my paper was to also suggest new kinds of collaborations between the state and private enterprise in pr promoting or kind of expanding a surveillance state that doesn't recognize those boundaries, but in fact produces uh, um, a mode of censorship that's closer to consumerism, right? Or a kind of um, a participating in a fantasy of immediacy of um, being a kind of surveillance subject rather than the subject of surveillance. I'll stop then.
Um, is it? Oh, I don't know if this is true, but is it true that there's no hard coded framework in India today um, when you're talking about censorship of films on streaming platforms? It's a it's a promise that uh, threatens to disappear every day. As of now, there are there is no hard and fast censorship of streaming films. And so, for example, if you were to watch RRR, which is the film whose censor certificate I showed at the end, mm -hmm. that censor certificate will not appear if you're watching it on streaming. Mm -hmm. right? So that's just a different uh, dynamic, but I, I'm, I'm doubtful that that will remain state of affairs. So the next couple of questions are for Sandeep. Um, the first one is, what are the chances of the creation of a digitally gated community in India? by algorithmic and biometric governance. Um, I mean, in, in some respects that already exists, right? <laughs> we, were, we were pretty much gated long before yeah. uh, biometric governance emerged on the picture. Uh, the two questions, uh, the second one, uh, do you want to read it? The kind of related. Yeah, the second one does, talks about, I think there's an increase in data monetization, but at the same time, there's popular endorsement to the DPIs by the state in the name of efficiency and other for other reasons. To what extent can a democratic state be held accountable um, if they create such infrastructures going on based on this, these kinds of logics? Uh, this is a, uh, both of these questions are related and great questions. Uh, the second question raises this concern that uh, when you allow governance to be shaped so intimately with the logics of venture capital or with the logics of financialization, uh, because that is 99% of what these digital infrastructure, public in, digital public infrastructures are imagined to do. Name COVID, Bharat Health Stack failed. Uh, UPI subsidized by government, God knows how long uh, they'll be able to do it. Uh, private companies, how long they will participate in this uh, co-subsidization model. Uh, and so on. So uh, the, the monetization front of it, the rubber meets the road somewhere where these entities simply fail. They uh, These are not like Wall Street entities that can continue to fail forward indefinitely. Uh, there is the size of our economy, uh, especially digital economy. After you cross the top 10% users, it is uh, almost impossible to generate revenue uh, for whether big or small startups from the vast majority of what India is. Um, so there is one limit condition there. The, the more scary uh, situation, which many commentators on uh, the digital protection bill have pointed out, which we have been seeing in our culture of governance uh, increasingly in the last decade, uh, is that rules-based governance is diminishing. Uh, accountability in general is diminishing and your current data protection bill is the most vague piece of legislation on data in the whole world. Uh, and when you uh, purposively keep these uh, vague clauses in, the, uh, in a piece of legislation, you allow for executive power to do whatever they want. And that is a more scary situation. What they do do, what they limit the power of uh, this uh, one uh, thing is RTI, right to information uh, has been diminished in the current data protection bill, right? So that is the most tangible threat to uh, what we imagine democratic accountability to be uh, as it existed in a messy way in India or, uh, or uh, in, in uh, future it could possibly exist. The fact that the same data protection bill now governs uh, your uh, exchanges related to RTI as, as it does with your Googles of the world or early stage startups of the world, that is a very novel condition that needs to be examined more closely uh, because their, their relationalities aren't going to disappear anytime in the near future. Right, these these tech companies and the state are going to interface with each other in one way or the other, at least for the remainder of our lifetimes, and unless climate change creates a completely new fantastic future, uh, or none at all. So, the the problem will persist, uh, and accountability is in a bleak state. Yeah, that's where I'll stop. 
uh, do you want to come in on that, Chitra, and and uh, and and also Karthik? It's a very kind of big meta question, but that it's, it's kind of important. And my guess is some of the issues that you cover in your paper or your work also connects to that, right? How can a democratic state in India be held more accountable as it becomes much more technologically dominant and pervasive? Karthik, would you like yes. to go first? Yes, please, please, yeah. Go ahead. Or should you want me oh. to? Who wants to go first? Okay, I'll, uh, go, I'll go first. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, thanks for that. Um, in terms of the CRZ, if you see, what has happened is that from the 2011 regulation onwards, what has happened is that they've introduced even more and more subzones. The maps has not, have not been updated. The mapping exercise actually happened long after the 2011, the mapping exercise in Mumbai happened about a year after the 2011 uh, policy was released. But there are lots of amendments that are also issued in the Gazette, right? There are constant amendments. So technically, the map has to be updated at all times. And that is not possible because mapping in, in that sense, in that you, if every time you have to do a ground truthing effort, make a ground truthing effort, it takes a lot of work. So since then, we have seen another policy come out, and that means that the maps have to be updated. That's one issue, is that the the documents that are the policy are often not the policy now. So that's, so there's a lot of confusion there. The second thing is that each of these amendments is often passed without any consultation uh, with Fisher communities. Or the consultation happens, which is like suggestions and objections, which is the 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 kind of uh, channel through which uh, you know the the state gathers. But then it has the power to ignore the suggestions and objections and pass the amendment anyway. And that is what has happened. If you look at the coast, a number of environmental protections have completely been stripped away in recent times. So it is an it is it is basically an environmental disaster, and. Um, for instance, Kudankulam is a very good example of, you know, the nuclear reactor coming up with the, or sewage treatment plants coming up, you know, without any sense of where, where small scale communi communities fish. In, if I have to go back to the map, the question of what is the geospatial policy and how does it operate and access to maps is also very, very important. Now, there are lots of groups doing uh, coastal mapping with communities at the shore. The issue is that the map they create, if they go to the court and they say it, and the state says, oh, you didn't use the official topographic sheet, or these are not the official boundaries of the district. That So then it creates this situation where those maps are not recognized. So in some sense, right, you have, then you are caught in this binary, that you have the state mapping, and then you have to resist, right? Whereas that in order for there to be, say, some sense of equity, we, like, I think one of the, really important things that shifts that might need to happen is how we think of coastal management, right? What we think of like as coastal management science and how can it include communities at the shoreline? What other pictures of sustainability exist out there and how do we actually make it a part of policy and a part of the map? And those questions are really important ones. You just shift it in terms of like not thinking of indigenous science as some inefficient category out there, but really thinking of it as sustainability practices, like, you know, yeah, that ought to be thought, uh, ought to be a part of the policy itself, where, yeah, I'll stop there. Uh, I'm, I'm going to come to you now, Karthik, but there's another question which is related to what I just asked you is, how is civil society responding to film censorship? I'm guessing in India now. So, it's kind of connected to the question that I posed to 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 Chitra as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. Um, and it's a, it's obviously a conversation that has many directions. I will say that um, certainly in the late seventies and definitely now, um, the meaning of civil society vis a vis film censorship is unstable. Um, civil society is often posited as the counter to or a kind of check on uh, the excesses of the state uh, when it comes to censoring film, right? And so a popular image might be 
protesters protesting the censorship of film and very famously around uh, Deepa Mehta's fire. We saw the activation of certain kind of civil society um, in kind of countering the censorship of the film. But I will also say that um, those of those scholars who've written about the operations of how censorship extends and renews itself, such as they just really Gunti and others, have described a phenomenon of super censorship, which is when the state relies on civil society actors to bring so-called public interest litigation or other complaints to the state, right? To say that this film should be censored, right? And in that case, often offense is outsourced to the citizenry or to the civil actor and therefore, and then channeled through the state. Um, and this kind of affective capture that drives the regulation of film. So to me, the relationship between um, uh, civil society and the state is one that sh shifts quite unstably through the period that I'm tracking. Um, the other question that's in the chat is, how does the state censorship of tech and films deal with the more rules-based reliant tech giants complying with regulations, with state policy towards films? If I understand the question correctly, I would say um, this is a kind of unfolding picture, but one of the phenomena that's been interesting to observe is how often Netflix or other streaming platforms in India may elect to show a version of the film uh, of a film that was um, certified for release in the theater rather than an uncensored version, right? And so here we see um, uh, tech playing a different kind of role in regrounding the authority of the state rather than challenging the authority of the state because of the certain kinds of kind of market state arrangements that Sandeep and uh, Chitra have also spoken about. Um, Sandeep, I wanted to just come back to you quickly because there are, there are two questions. I think it's the same question, but um, which is related again to this to this theme of accountability and democratic uh, control. How much citizen knowledge awareness is there on what's happening in terms of data governance, data collection, and the role of the state in this area? Well, um, there isn't much. Uh, uh, digital literacy is a big problem globally, uh, and more so in, in societies like ours, where coercive power was of the state was used in full force to enroll uh, people in Aadhaar uh, whether it was in through courts or executive power or is straight up in rural areas, uh, making it impossible for people to get access to their basic fundamental right uh, rights without signing up for this. Um, so that is one. And uh, to safeguard citizens, there are a lot of people doing great work in uh, progressive digital uh, space. Uh, whether it is on AI, whether it is on disinformation, whether it is on elections. And, and in each of these spheres, we see that our, a lot of our 20th century imaginaries of transparency do not work because these are uh, systems with many layers of abstraction, right? Uh, the, the act of reveal of transparency is unlikely to uh, uh, lead us into a right direction here. Uh, what uh, what does help is tracing intermediaries uh, because regardless of the command and control imaginary, there is no one place where everybody is playing with one button that has all control. There are various intermediaries with distributed uh, access uh, to, to our data or uh, exercise moderation over it and so on. And keeping a track of those intermediaries, what does GDPR do or what do, what do better legislations do? Or what do people uh, who are trying to create different kinds of tech platforms, collectives, they do something like Signal does not even collect your data, so forget monetizing it. Uh, so that is one model. But the entities that are collecting, just uh, getting more aware of with which different entities are involved and what are they trying to do with it is one step in the right direction. There won't be one grand reveal where uh, you find all the answers uh, as such, yeah. Um, we have about a minute left, so I'm gonna do something perhaps a little unfair and ask each of you maybe just to talk very briefly about whether you're optimistic or pessimistic of how the state governs the issue that you're looking at, whether it's censorship, coastal policy, or data going ahead. 
because we've talked a lot about temporality and time. So looking ahead, what is your what is your sense of how the state behaves in your particular area in the future? So maybe I'll start with Karthik first this time. I don't have an answer on that question. Uh, it, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a critical thinker, so uh, I have cause to be um, wary. Um, and yet, I think a lot of the work we do is in service of some kind of civil society style liberation. Uh, my sense is that my sense is that the enclosure is increasing rather than decreasing. Uh, that was what the promise was. Um, and yet we are finding newer and, and newer forms of control that are extended through the market uh, and private tech um, that renew the state rather than uh, in any way um, cause it to decline. And those new arrangements are what would be of interest to anyone working on from censorship in the contemporary moment. Sandeep? Yeah, so um, the final chapter of my dissertation actually was titled uh, uh, Towards a Post-Democratic Governance of Aspiration. Uh, so a lot of what we are seeing with techno-entrepreneurial and financialization futures in the global south in general, but in India specifically because it is so tightly woven into the fabric of digital economy here and very tightly coupled with the state. Um, is that in, in a sphere where 99% failure is completely acceptable, as long as you get that one unicorn that makes all the profits for venture capitalists, with, with something, uh, with that kind of ideology uh, intermingling in a demographic uh, condition like ours, where 99% are always assumed you, you'll fail anyway. Uh, so this is a much, uh, deeper and uh, insidious combination playing out and data is one of the key technological objects through which this is being negotiated, enacted, imagined, narrativized and so on. Uh, people who otherwise would not have ever imagined themselves to be techno entrepreneurs uh, now connected with smartphones and, and some sort of almost theological belief that this is, this is where future making lies are jumping into this space. So why, what will happen to the larger uh, democratic outcomes is, uh, I mean, uh, the macro political condition of the country is for everyone to see, but we are the ho a whole new aspirational generation from small cities. It's not just Bangalore's and Delhi's uh, anymore. We have over 100,000 startups distributed and there are school programs, college programs, the whole uh, shenanigans uh, have been going on across the country. So there's a whole new generation that is jumping into the sphere with a certain promise. Now, I am very scared of when that when those promises break, as, uh, as most of them will likely do, uh, what will follow them? So I'll just leave you with that thought, yeah. And Chitra, the last word is yours. Thanks. Um, I think Sandeep and Karthik beautiful but also you know actually like really important points on the table um and honestly speaking for the if if we are talk, talking about future making right honestly speaking what it would entail a huge shift in just moving away from say growth based policies for the fisheries industry um unfortunately i do not see how that would happen, say, in the immediate future, given the ways in which we are incredibly, like the, the, the policies are incredibly target oriented. That is at the, so for it to change, it would mean a fundamental shift in even how we conceive of economic, uh, what we conceive of economic growth at the coast, right? Um, what we or moving away from the growth growth metrics um and in and the the broader canvas i'm working on is is of course climate change so um the the verdicts out on that one which is that there is no way to control uh the the rise or the sea level rise that we are going to experience over the next century 
So I, I, though I have the last word, it is an incredibly pessimistic point of view that I am coming from, given the the fields I'm working on. Well, on that pessimistic note, I wanted to thank all our speakers for a fabulous set of papers and the conversation, which is continued after that, and thank the audience for all their great questions. Um, some of us have books coming out. I know that Karthik's book is coming out early next year. I think Chitra is at some point, and somewhere down the road, Sandeep. So I hope um, I look forward to reading and engaging with all of you in the future. Um, just on a final note, the there's one more roundtable in the ISAS International Conference at 3 p.m., and I hope all of you can join us, uh, ex except our participants from the U.S., who I can see are already falling asleep. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us, and bye. Thanks, Karthik. Thanks, Karthik. Bye, Jitra. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.